This is Land of Havilah, Job 38. We've come to the final five chapters of the book, which will be mostly Yahweh speaking to Job. Verse 1. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, for I'll question you. Then you answer me. Comment in answer to Yahweh's question in verse 2, it's Job who's been darkening counsel by words without knowledge. So now we find out if we listen to Job that he confused us more than he enlightened us because he didn't know what he was talking about. He darkened counsel without knowledge. In verse 2, Yahweh says, Brace yourself like a man. He's about to give Job a tongue lashing. He says, I will question you, then you answer me. In other words, he's about to ask Job a long series of questions over the next several chapters for teaching purposes. When the teacher asks questions, rather than making statements, we call that the Socratic method of teaching. But the book of Job predates Socrates, so the asking of questions is more accurately Yahweh's method of teaching. By asking questions with obvious answers, Yahweh will prove that he never left Job in the dark. The questions are obvious and so are the answers, so it angers Yahweh that he even has to ask them. Job should have asked them himself and answered them himself before he spewed words without knowledge. Nevertheless, Yahweh is gracious, so he'll do the asking. Going on with these obvious questions and answers, Yahweh says, verse 4, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who determined its measures, if you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Whereupon were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it broke out of the womb, when I made clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, marked it out for my bound, set bars and doors, and said, Here you may come, but no further. Here your proud waves shall be stayed. Comment, the answers are obvious, but let's supply them anyway. Job was not present when God laid the foundations of the earth. God determined the earth's dimensions and measured them out. Job has no idea where the earth's foundations are fastened, what the foundation is like, but all this was witnessed by morning stars and the sons of God, which seem to be angels in the context of this book. It was God who originated the sea and all the mysteries it contains by methods beyond our grasp, and God who set the sea's boundaries so that the surf comes up on the land so far, but no further. The point of all this is that it's absurd to contend with God. He who picks a fight with God will lose. He'll lose a philosophical debate with God or any other type of fight. That should be pretty obvious. But since it wasn't obvious to Job, Yahweh will go on in the same vein for several chapters until Job is thoroughly silenced. Verse 12. Have you commanded the morning in your days and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and shake the wicked out of it? It is changed as clay under the seal and presented as a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld. The high arm is broken. Comment in verses 12 and 13, God commands the morning to come, causing the dawn to know its place as the boundary of it creeps across the earth. And in a figurative sense, his bringing of light to the earth in the morning shakes or purges the wicked out of it. And verse 14, anyone outdoors during that early morning transition from darkness to light can see the earth taking shape. He sees how God has stamped the contours of the earth as clay under a seal, meaning as a person might put contours in wet clay with a stamp. The earth takes shape to us at dawn, whereas before it was featureless. God gives understanding the same way. Things dawn on us. We see things begin to take shape as he gives us understanding. But in verse 15, God withholds the light of understanding from the wicked. The high arm of the wicked is broken at dawn, meaning God puts an end to their wickedness as he brings in the light. All that was, just, all that was in just 12 words of Hebrew poetry. Poetry isn't the multiplication of words, it's the distillation of thought into the fewest possible words. It packs a punch, it's thought compressed. To understand poetry, we have to decompress it. Still speaking to Job, Yahweh says, verse 16, Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the earth in its width? Declare, if you know it all, what is the way to the dwelling of light, 
As for darkness, where is its place, that you should take it to its bound, that you should discern the paths to its house? Surely you know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Comment, all this is unknown to man, but known to Yahweh. He knows exactly what's in the deep, whether it's the depths of the sea, or of the earth, or the deep mysteries that await us in death. And he knows the extreme limits of light and darkness. Talk about a knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve are overwhelmed just by a glimpse of good and evil. But God knows the limits of good and evil in verses 16 to 20. And in verse 21, let's not say sarcasm is always wrong because Yahweh was sarcastic when he said to Job, Surely you know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. But even though Yahweh can cut a man with sarcasm, it's something man should be careful with because sarcasm does cut. Verse 22. Have you entered the treasuries of the snow, or have you seen the treasuries of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? Comment, God has unlimited storehouses of snow and hail that he can unleash on the earth any time he wants and smother it. Similarly, in case of trouble, battle, or war, God has more ammo than we could imagine. His stockpiles are unlimited. He'll have overwhelming victory. Verse 24. By what way is the lightning distributed or the east wind scattered on the earth? Who has cut a channel for the flood water or the path for the thunderstorm to cause it to rain on a land where no man is, on the wilderness in which there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate ground, to cause the tender grass to grow? Comment, God can bring about a stunning reversal in the landscape by converting a distant, uninhabited desert into a raging flood zone. The flood will gouge out channels in the earth. Just the same, He can bring about a stunning reversal of any situation. As the desert was uninhabited, God can reverse any situation all by Himself. Speaking of needing no help, verse 28, Does the rain have a father? Or who fathers the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice? the gray frost of the sky, who has given birth to it? The waters become hard like stone when the surface of the deep is frozen. Comment coming up, Pleiades, Orion, and the Bear are constellations. Verse 31. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loosen the cords of Orion? Can you lead the constellations out in their season? Or can you guide the bear with her cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you establish its dominion over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that abundance of waters may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that they may go? Do they report to you, here we are? Comment, the obvious takeaway is that since God can do all these things in natural affairs, we should remember that He has awesome abilities in any type of affair. In verse 35, every lightning bolt gives a report to God saying, here I am. Lightning bolts don't answer to Job. Verse 36, who has put wisdom in the inward parts, or who has given understanding to the mind? Comment, God's the author of our consciousness and the ability to think. Consciousness is more than atoms of our brains rubbing together. Verse 37. Who can count the clouds by wisdom, or who can pour out the containers of the sky when the dust runs into a mass and the clods of earth stick together? Comment, the rain causes dust or dirt clods to coalesce into a massive wet earth. Verse 39. Can you hunt the prey for the lioness or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in the thicket? Comment. Current teaching is that evolution taught lions how to hunt. It's laughable on the surface of it. That's much too complex a thing that would ever arise by some natural phenomenon. Since scientists have no idea how to explain the origin of life, no idea how to explain the genesis of that first putative biologic organism, which would theoretically be the simplest life there is, we can safely say they're gaslighting us that they're able to explain the more complex developments that supposedly came later. They gaslight as a matter of pride, and because they swallow the party line of those who came before them, and to keep their jobs in positions, and because they'd rather live in sin than acknowledge God and repent. But that's not the way they see it. Their foolish heart is darkened, Romans 1.21. Scientific departments at universities don't tolerate creationists. Creationists don't apply. If they're in the job, they must stay silent. If they're discovered, they'll either be fired or they won't advance. No department chairman wants to be embarrassed by a creationist on his staff. 
He doesn't want his department to be a laughing stock. But the trick to laughing is that you never want to laugh too soon. Verse 41. Who provides for the raven his prey when his young ones cry to God and wander for lack of food? Comment, when we cry out for the food of understanding and wander in search of it, God will bring it to us. Yahweh will continue pointing out the obvious that we so often forget. And Job 39 next.